I have a prayer as pure as gold that where you lead me I will go and I'll embrace that holy plea each time your spirit calls to me and in that hour and in that time when I must lose my will in thine my true devotion will be found the day I lay my Isaac down each sacrifice you call me to I'll die to self I'll live for you take up the cross forsake the crown the day I lay my Isaac down Your Lamb of Love, my blessed friend, nailed to the altar for each sin. There in my place your love was bound the day you laid your Isaac down. Each sacrifice you call me to, I'll die to self, I'll live for you. Take up the cross, forsake the crown, the day you lay your Isaac down. Each sacrifice you call me to, I'll die to self, I'll live for you. Take up the cross, forsake the crown, the day you lay your Isaac down. Take up the cross, forsake the crown, the day you lay your Isaac down, the day you lay your Isaac down. Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, thank you for the wonderful music. And thank you again for being a part of the 2009 West Coast Baptist Youth Conference. And let's stand together as we find our Bibles and open them to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I want to begin by commending all of you for your testimony. I told some of our leadership earlier this day, I've been so encouraged by the uh, spirit of the teenagers at this conference. Uh, there has been a spirit of uh, servant heartedness. There's been a spirit of sharing, and I haven't heard any complaining and such. And I just appreciate that. And I want to ask you the next few moments, I'm going to preach for the next 30 minutes or so. I'm going to ask you in this final session that we have together to pray with me in a moment when I pray and ask the Lord to speak to your heart in a special way. And I'm going to ask you also, if you would, to just determine right now to listen very intently. If you feel like you're going to have to slip out for something in the next 30 minutes, uh, maybe do that when I start to pray in just a moment. Don't, don't let the devil get you up and just walking out for no reason. If it's an emergency, we understand that. Some of you have been fanning yourselves a little bit. And uh, if, you're, if you're a little hot right now, there's some air blowing outside. Go out and get some of that and then sit in the lobby and uh, listen to the message on the TV. But don't, don't run in and out. And by the way, when you're at home, don't run in and out during preaching. When, when there's a pastor who comes, a preacher who comes, try to always 
uh, help him too when he's preaching and listen. And I know that's what you want to do. Now, by the time you get home, some of you will get home by maybe even late tomorrow, you'll probably be a little tired when you get home. And I've always said it's better to be tired and happy than rested and miserable. If you're a little tired, but God's done something great in your heart, then it's worth it, Amen. all right? And I hope that when you get home, though you might be a little tired, that you'll be a little closer to the Lord because you came uh, to this year's conference. I, I heard about a boy, I believe he was about 12 years old, he, he went into the market one day, and as he walked into the market, he saw the grocery store manager there, and... and uh, in his arms, he had his cat with him, had a little pet there with him, and he had been at home, he'd been watching television, he saw a commercial for a uh, particular kind of detergent, and he thought when he saw that commercial, they said it would do so many wonderful things, he said, you know, I'm going to go get some of that detergent, and I'm going to give my cat a bath, and he just thought that'd be the right thing to do, and he hadn't given his cat a bath in a while, and he walked in, he got the detergent, the manager saw him walking out. The manager said, son, I hope you're not planning to give your cat a bath with that detergent. He said, you could kill that cat with that detergent. The little boy just kind of went on his way, and he thought he knew what he was doing. And about three days later, he came back into the store. This time he had no cat. His head was down. He's kind of looking discouraged. The manager said, I knew it. I knew it. You killed your cat, didn't you? That detergent killed the cat. The little boy said, well... It wasn't the detergent that got him, it was the spin cycle that got him. <laughs> now sometimes when you come to youth conference, when it's all over, you feel like you've been in the spin cycle, don't you? You're a little tired, but uh, hopefully your heart will be lighter and you'll have the joy of the Lord because you were here in this place. I want you to follow with me as I read 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse number 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephes Demon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on, the side, on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had an helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass uh, upon, between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him, and he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out and set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then ye shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege to open your infallible word this morning. We thank you that we have today an inspired word of God that guides our steps and lights our way. And Lord, we ask this morning that you would help us as we open your word to understand how we might in this day make a difference, even as David in his day. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to every heart today, and we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Perhaps you heard about the teenager several months ago at Six Flags over Georgia, he was a 17-year-old boy looking for a good time, and he and his friends had gone with a group of young people to Six Flags, and they were looking forward to the rides. They were looking forward to just being together, hanging out, as they say. And this 17-year-old boy by the name of LaShawn was enjoying his day, and, and yet after one particular ride, unbeknownst to his friends, he slipped off to the side, and he went into an area by one of the rides. In fact, it was directly beneath one of the rides, and he went into that area having 
traversed two different fences to get there. He jumped those fences. He saw clear signs that said, danger, do not enter. But for some strange reason, LaShawn entered anyways. He did what he wanted to do. He disregarded the boundaries that were there for his safety. And he went over the two fences into the area there at Six Flags over Georgia into the Batman roller coaster ride area. And as he went into this particular area, his friends weren't sure why he went. His, his uh, friends said later they didn't even know he had done it until suddenly a scream was heard from people on the ride. And apparently as LaShawn had gone into this restricted area, the roller coaster came around at just a particular time and hit LaShawn, decapitating him in front of hundreds of bystanders. The police began asking, what was it all about? I mean, was it a dare? What would cause somebody to see such plainly posted signs and then just go into the roller coaster area like that? After much investigation, most accounts from the police reports indicated that the young man went in to the roller coaster restricted area because he wanted to find his hat that fell off when he was riding Batman just a little while earlier. He had to get his hat. It was a special flat-rimmed hat. He especially liked to wear it in a particular way. It had a particular logo on it that identified him with a particular group of people, and, and it was uh, meaningful to him. And, and so he had to get in there, and he had to get his hat. And it appears as we... Look at LaShawn's tragic story and as we look at teenagers around the country today that it seems that many times our image matters to us more than our life. LaShawn's image, looking just the right way, mattered to him more than his life. He literally sacrificed the permanent on the altar of the immediate. Looking a certain way at that moment meant more to him than even being safe with his own life. I wonder this morning, what is it that makes you feel cool? And what is it that you will sacrifice to keep it? Perhaps today it's the acceptance of a boyfriend. Being with him makes you feel like you're someone special. And I wonder what you would sacrifice in that relationship in order to maintain that feeling that you think is so very important. Maybe not your life, you would say, although many with AIDS have said that. Not your purity, you would say, but many attenders of youth conference have said that, and yet uh, somehow to keep what they think is cool, they sacrifice things that God would not have them to sacrifice. I wonder today, is it the acceptance of your friends that you crave? And would you do crazy things just for them uh, to accept you? And, 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 and maybe it's not a hat. Maybe it's something else that's really important to you. But I want you to understand that you teenagers are living in a day, and young people, hear me, you're living in a day where the world is intimidating you and the world like Goliath is crying out to you and saying, I defy you and I challenge you to wear what we want you to wear and act the way we want you to act and dress the way we want you to dress and do the things we want you to do. And many teenagers are risking everything so that the world will accept them. LaShawn got his hat, but he lost his life. Oh, you might get that special relationship you thought that was the goal. I mean, you've read some girly magazines. The goal is to have a boyfriend. You might have gotten a boyfriend, but what have you lost in the process? You see, the world today is defying you. They're challenging you not to live for God, but to live for the image that they have created. Goliath was defying the children of Israel. He was challenging them day after day. I want you to notice the defiance of the world in this passage. 
I want you to see how Goliath, with all of his military might, how the Philistines had come against the children of Israel there in the Valley of Elah. About 1200 B.C., the Philistines had discovered how they could take particular metals, and in particular, they had learned how to take iron and create a great weaponry with it. Goliath was not only a very large man, as we'll see in a moment, but he had the best equipment of the day, and, and he defied the armies of Israel. I want you to understand the defiance of the world is not first and foremost against you. It is against God. Do you understand this morning that the rock and roll crowd is not just trying to make money? Do you understand they are against the teachings of the Word of God? Do you understand this morning that uh, whether it's uh, the rappers or Madonna or whether it's some of the other rock and roll crowd, that they defy the Word of God, they defy the teachings of the Word of God, they defy the truth of Jesus Christ being the only way to heaven, and they are against what we believe from the Word of God today. 1 Samuel 17, 43, And the Philistines said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And, by the, Philist and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. You see, the, the, the fact is that the Philistine felt that it was his gods that were more powerful and more prominent. And to them, this was a religious battle as well. The defiance of the world is against your God. Uh, do you understand the Hollywood industry that makes the video games? Uh, do you understand they're against your God? They're against the teachings of the Bible. But the defiance of the world, of course, is also against God's people. Against the people of God. The Valley of Elah was the place where the battle was set in array. And as they came together at this particular place, I believe uh, you'll see that there was, a, uh, there was a, a chasm, if you will, between the children of Israel and the, uh, the Philistines. And, and Goliath stood there and Goliath intimidated the children of Israel day after day, just like the rappers and the rock and roll crowd and the scornful kid in the Christian school tries to intimidate you into not following God. Goliath is like the world shouting down God's people, defying God and his people. Notice there in the Bible, 1 Samuel 17 and verse 7, the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Ezekah. And notice verse 2, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and pitched. And, and verse 3, the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel on the other side. And verse 4, the Philistine champion Goliath would come out. And the Bible tells us about this man. He had a helmet of brass. He had a coat of mail. He had his legs covered in brass. And he stood there on his side with a spear, the head of which weighed about 18 pounds. And he stood there intimidating day after day after day. Now listen, some of you attend the public school and you're going to go back to your public school and you're going to uh, not be ashamed of Jesus and, and you're going to have uh, some modesty about you and you're, you're going to stop cursing and some of you are going to go to a Christian school and you're going to say God's called me to ministry and, and you're going to take your stand and I guarantee wherever you go back to in Colorado, Pennsylvania, Florida, some foreign country, there will be somebody there saying, oh yeah, you're going to live for God, are you? Somebody will defy you when it comes to the matter of living for God. The devil will stand there. Sometimes he'll stand there defying you. You laugh. That's what they do. Their baggy britches. Their underwear hanging out. Their crooked hair. Why don't some of you so-called God-called men of God to preach start acting like a man of God? Amen. And they defy you. Dr. Rasmussen, would you just for a moment be Goliath? I felt you were the most qualified this morning. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> By the way, God's a God of order. When you've got God working in your heart, your life's going to be orderly. Your hair will look sharp. Your hat will be straight. Your step will be sure. Your handshake will be firm. You'll be able to look me in the eye because you haven't been looking at things you shouldn't look at. 
But the intimidating crooked world with their crooked hat, crooked language, crooked music, and immorality, when you try to live for God, they're going to stand there intimidating you and challenging you and saying, oh yeah, that's what you're going to do. And they were winning the battle here in Elah. Look in verse 16, the Bible says, but when David returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem, the Philistine drew morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Listen, David's brothers were being intimidated day after day. Verse 11 says, they were dismayed and greatly afraid greatly afraid one of the things that's tragic today is that many of you are being influenced by the world you don't fear God you fear men the fear of man bringeth a snare the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and here they were fear, fearfully uh, standing around. They were in dismay. Uh, they, were, uh, they were afraid of what Goliath was going to do to them. You know what some of you need to do with old Goliath? You need to say, hey, Goliath, I don't care anymore about your crooked pants, uh, your crooked hat, your saggy pants. I don't care about your music anymore. I am going to stand up, stand up for Jesus Christ. Thank you, Dr. Rasmussen. The world is constantly intimidating. The giants of this world are after you. They're trying to tell you you can't live for God. There are many giants today. I think of the giant of technology. And I think about Facebook today. Let's just get personal about it. Say, well, Facebook's not bad. We can have Facebook. No, but here's what's happening now. I know a lot of young people with their little personal websites. It doesn't. It doesn't have the Romans wrote and I've looked. It doesn't say on there how to get to heaven. You know what we find more and more that young people are being tempted just to take a little more clothing off. Now you can't have total nudity, but well, the devil and Goliath will take partial nudity if he can get it. Trash talking. And some of you sit here like, boy, I'm just one of the best in my youth group. You're only as good as your Facebook. That's who you really are. And the fact is there's the giant of technology. I think of MySpace. Thank God most pastors have had enough courage to stand up against it. And I'll just go ahead and say if you have a MySpace today, you're either not right with God or you're playing in a dangerous pool of piranhas today. Reuters news service reported last month there are 90,000 sexual predators on MySpace looking for teenagers like you who just want to rebel at your parents or your pastor or who think that all the standards are just a bunch of legalism and all the rules are just to kill your joy so that you can't have any fun. Listen, you're going to have to determine are you going to be intimidated by the world like the average worldly church or are you going to stand up like David and make a difference in your generation? Technology. I think about the newest game from Xbox. The game is simply called Demon Stone. The whole game's about dungeons, dragons, and demons. It's all about the dark side and wickedness. And I'm sure if I asked you to raise your hands, there's young people in this room right here who've already purchased the game. I'm simply saying the giant of technology, your friends at school, hey, did you get this new game? Uh, did you get the demon stone? Do you have it? Hey, young person, why don't you decide if you are a blood-washed Christian, you don't need to be playing around with demon stone. It's not a joke anymore. It's time that we recognize there's a battle going on and the devil's trying to intimidate us. And even in this recession, the number one growing industry in America is the video game industry because somehow people are finding money to spend millions of dollars on this game called Demon Stone. To understand this morning, there is the giant of technology tempting you and Teenagers every day are doing things on the internet that are absolutely unthinkable. You know why? They're being intimidated by the giant Goliath. They're being intimidated by the saggy pants, a crooked hat, a crowd. They're being intimidated by the perverted crowd. They're being intimidated by the Philistine rather than living for God. You see today, the giant of technology is calling you out. And many of you are kind of cowering and afraid. You'd be afraid to say, I'm a born again Christian. I've taken a vow of purity. I'm going to serve Jesus with my life. There's the giant of worldly styles. 
It seems like it calls out from every billboard. I mean, it's like, it's like Goliath is up there on the billboard and, and calling out and saying, Hey girls, look at The Bible says modest apparel. And the Bible would indicate there's some things to save uh, for marriage. But don't listen to the Bible. I call you out, girls. That's what the devil's saying today. I'm, I'm talking today to girls that you're being challenged every day to look more and more like a prostitute and less and less like a woman of God. And some of you, I appreciate so much the youth workers and many of you girls, uh, this is new to you. It's a little funny, you know, wearing these long uh, 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 culottes or whatever and having the dresses. And, and, and I appreciate that, that you did it for the conference. But let me just challenge you. Why don't you go on and be modest even after the conference? Why don't you just say there's some things in my life that will be sacred till the day I'm married and I'm not going to listen to the Goliath of, uh, of this world. I'm not going to follow uh, the clothing uh, styles. World Net uh, Daily reported that Abercrombie & Fitch catalog contained uh, in its recent catalog 45 specific portrayals of sexual imagery in the first 120 pages of the catalog uh, por- targeting 10 to 13 year olds. It seems like Abercrombie and Fitch is just saying, hey, you want to be cool, seductive, you want to look like you're maybe a little gay or a little loose, then wear uh, this brand and showing partially nude uh, teenagers in their catalog. Look at, I know, you say, well, where do you draw the line? There's so many labels. They're all owned by ungodly people. I can't tell you in every case where to draw the line, but I can tell you this. When you find out uh, that there's a company that's endorsing smut, and when you find out there's a particular style or name brand that seems to be worn uh, by the rebel crowd and the loose crowd, Don't you let Goliath tell you how to dress. The giant of the clothing styles. I know of some girls right here today, and I'm glad you're here. You rode down on the bus. If you're not careful, the minute you step back on your public school campus, you're going to let them scare you right back into being one of them. And frankly, if you go to public school, I'm glad you do, but take your stand there. The giant of worldly styles. I think about the giant of permissiveness. Seems like everything the world says is uh, give a green light to sex. That's what the world says. Let me tell you what the Bible says. Flee youthful lusts. It seems like the world is calling out to this generation more than ever. Newsweek reported that in 2008, one in four teenage girls in America has a sexually transmitted disease. One in four. Say, oh, you know, I just, I just come from a really good, nice neighborhood. I just come from a really great place. Probably one in four in your really nice neighborhood. Your little nice friends. Listen, uh, what you want to do is try to bring them to church. Try to win them to Christ. You don't want to adapt to their lifestyle. STDs are on the rise in America. More than 3 million teens, according to the study, uh, right now have a particular virus that causes cervical cancer. It's being uh, transmitted through uh, sexual activity in teen girls ages 14 to 19. And it seems like uh, this uh, giant uh, of, of immorality and permissiveness calls out. And young people, instead of standing true and making vows of purity, are, 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 are trying uh, various different ways of immorality. And they're finding the result of it is heartache and loneliness and disease and death and it's time for Christian children to say no to Goliath and Christian teenagers to say no to Goliath and single adults to say you can taunt me all you want. You can have your bad attitude all you want but I'm telling you I'm going to stand here and fight for the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh the giant of secularism is at work and many of you aren't even aware of how much so. This idea that we don't need God The National Educators Association for our public school system in America now has new textbooks coming out this year. Not one story in their books is uplifting motherhood. They uplift sex role reversals. They uplift the idea of gay marriage. SB 777 here in California states now that if a boy thinks that maybe he's a transgender or he's not sure if he's a boy anymore, he can now go into the girls' bathroom in the public school. You cannot have in California uh, on prom night, which I'm not a fan of prom night anyways, you youth pastors ought to have some substitute plan for prom night. 
that doesn't have dancing, gyrating, sensual alcohol at the core of it. But you cannot have in prom night in California a prom king or queen. Because that might be discriminatory to the homosexuals. And secularism of the anti-God philosophy is a giant that's calling out and the message isn't going away, teenagers. It's calling out day after day. I'm simply saying Goliath is doing all that he can to stand up and intimidate you. You need to look this way. You need to be this way. And a lot of youth pastors are capitulating and they're trying to be Joe Cool with the teenagers. And you know what's happening? Their teenagers have just as many STDs as the unsaved teenagers. God help these youth pastors wearing their earrings and their tattoos and trying to tell us that they are men of God. They're pimps. They're not men of God. They're selling a generation down the tube as they try to act like they're just Joe Cool. What they're doing is they're selling a message that is not the message of the Word of God. Goliath intimidates and then Goliath instigates. Notice in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 10, and the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. You see, the devil's a bully. He's always trying to intimidate you into going his way. Teenagers, do you understand? It took six years and eight months to build the trade towers. And it took just one hour and 42 minutes to tear them down. Six years and eight months to build the towers and... One hour, 42 minutes later, they were gone. Do you understand your mom and dad spend tens of thousands of dollars raising you and, and hundreds of hours and loving you and pastors praying for you and youth pastors praying for you? Do you understand that in just a few moments, the devil wants to tear down everything that God's been trying to build up in your life? The defiance of the world is very evident. Goliath was someone you just couldn't miss. And I'm telling you, before you leave Lancaster, there will be billboards. There will be people in your bus trying to listen to it, watch it. I'm telling you, before you get out of town, Goliath's going to say, come this way. Come this way. I defy you to make a difference. Just be like the rest of us. You want to be a real rebel? Live for God. Amen. <laughs> Everybody else is going this other way. You want to make a difference, you've got to be different to make a difference. If you're just kind of blending in with the crowd, you'll never make a difference with all of this. You want to be different, stand up. Stand up for Jesus. That's how you make a difference. The defiance of the world. Notice, secondly, the decision of David. Now, David grew up around cowardly people. His brothers were cowardly. David saw, if you will, the compromise, the softness. But David made some decisions in his life. And I just want to be honest with you. Decisions are a part of this conference. Because decisions are a part of the Christian life. Notice David's decision, first of all, was a decision to surrender. He was willing to surrender to the call of God upon his life. Notice this, if you would, in chapter 16 and verse 7. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen thee. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. By the way, usually the guy that God's going to use is the one that's just busy doing what he's supposed to be doing. Someone who's working when others are playing. Someone who's singing to God when others are rapping with their rock music. And here, Jesse says to Samuel, I've, I've got one son. And, and Samuel says to Jesse, fetch for him. And he went and brought him in. And he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, arise and anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Let me say today, we don't have any cans of oil up here. And we don't necessarily need to pour oil on your head. If God perhaps is calling you to be his man, his prophet, uh, his king, his spokesman. If God is calling you to be a pastor, missionary. There's no cans of oil here in the orchestra area. But there is still the Holy Spirit of God who touches and anoints and calls out men of God to preach the word of God. 
He did in my life when I was 13. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. The Holy Spirit of God touched my heart in Palmer Lake, Colorado and said, I, I want you to preach the gospel of Christ. Oh, I went through some rocky times, some ups and downs. I, I had some difficulties in my teenage years, but I never got over that decision I made at a summer camp that God had placed upon my heart the calling uh, that came from the Spirit of God to be a preacher of the gospel. God may want to choose some of you today. Just as Samuel poured the oil on David and just as this man, David, surrendered to that process and just as this young man was willing to say, Lord, I want you to use me. I'm, I'm ready for you to use me. God may want to call you today. And I'm simply saying, why don't some of you take that iPod out of your ear just long enough to hear from God? And why don't some of you stop texting just for Long enough to hear God say, I want you to be used in a great way. I want you to go to the uttermost part of the earth with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, listen, you can take your Nintendo DS if you want, and you can keep accessing your trash on it, and you can keep gossiping on it, and you can keep playing games and, and trying to erase the history. Look, you can play that game and live with your guilt and live with your sin and live with your immorality, your iPod and your Nintendo DS and whatever other way you try to access it all. But I'm telling you, my friend, there's a God in heaven who sent his son Jesus to shed his blood for you and he saved you and he calls you with a purpose in mind oh you say but you don't understand I, I, I'm, I, I mean I think about it but I, I'm just a little busy with my iPhone I got my iPhone browser working here I can check some things out then erase the history uh, real quick and I've got some other games I want to play with my friends afterward listen I understand all of that it's called spiritual noise pollution and the more you have of it it seems the less God can get through and it's time to put some of it down and hear God Amen. hear Him He wants you to surrender your life. This man, David, he made a decision. He was a young teenager. I'm sure he'd understand all this oil and this prophet and what's this all about. And I know there are some teenagers here right now. This is very new to you. What's this all about? I'll tell you what it's all about. It's all about a God in heaven who has a plan for your life. Goliath has a plan. Goliath's plan is no church and try a little bit of music and a little bit of immorality and a little bit of this and that. And Goliath is a loser. Goliath is. Loser Goliath has a plan, but there's a God in heaven who has a plan. David surrendered. And then David made a decision to serve. And it really is a decision. When you surrender your life to the Lord, and you don't know if you're going to be a preacher but you know you're going to serve God somehow. And I want you to see that David made this decision first towards his earthly father. In the first place, he had a right relationship with his father. Would you look at 1 Samuel 17, 17? And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and those ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren. And carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand and look how uh, thy brethren fare and take, the, take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistine. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went. And as Jesse commanded him, he came to the trench as his host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left the carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran to the army and came and saluted his brethren. This is a simple illustration, but I want you to get it. David's father came to him. Listen to me, young people. And David's father said, I want you to take this food to your brethren. I want you to do what I'm asking you to do. And one of the reasons that many of you do not listen to God in the way that you should is because you do not listen to your parents in the way that you should. That's why the devil wants you to be rebellious towards your fathers. There's a relationship here with your heavenly father. And here we see that when Jesse said, David, I want you to go, David did not argue. He didn't say, hey, don't you know I've been anointed king? Come on, Dad, I don't run errands down to the battlefield anymore. Samuel poured the oil on me. I'm going to be the king here. I'm taking Saul's spot. Get someone else to take the oil. Young people, you listen to me. God will bless your right response to authority. You say, my parents aren't saved or they're not perfect. Welcome to America. 
Lots of people's parents aren't saved. My wife is one of the godliest pastor's wives, one of the godliest wives in America. She grew up in the home of an alcoholic who regularly beat her, who regularly threw liquor at her, who regularly cursed her. Uh, he was vile. He was wicked. And, and the fact of the matter is some of you need to stop making your excuses about how bad it was and just start saying, Lord, I'm going to do what you've called me to do. Well, they just don't understand. They just had a perfect life. No one's had a perfect life. And David was simply a young man who was willing to obey his father and do what his father said. I've watched this, Dr. Getch. I've watched teenagers who've kept a right heart towards the parents. And I've watched God honor that. Somehow, those are the kinds that can get it right with God. I think of our daughter, Danielle. She's our oldest. And I have... Four wonderful children, I thank God for them. But I remember when our daughter Danielle was in high school, then later here at West Coast Baptist College. And she began to date a young man some of you have met around here, one of the young leaders on this staff, Brother Peter Mord. And I remember watching that process. It was, it was awkward for me, seeing her fall in love with some jerkweed. She told me she would always just stay in love with me. She broke her word on that one. She wrote me a letter before her engagement to Peter. I'll not read all of it to you, but I'll read a few portions of it. Dad, you're the kind of dad every girl dreams of. That, that's the part where she's buttering me up a little bit right there. I thank the Lord all the time for placing me in our family. Thank you for raising me in a Christian home, in a godly and balanced environment. Thank you for providing godly influences and hundreds of opportunities to make decisions for the Lord. Thank you for ensuring that we received a quality education. Thank you for starting a Bible college. Thank you for fighting spiritual battles for our family. Thank you for all the long talks. Thank you for helping us with bad attitudes or bad grades or bad friends. Thank you recently for all your talks about dating and about the future. God has blessed me beyond measure by allowing me to grow up in your home. I love you and thank you for all you've done for me. Thank you for all the counsel and time you've given me in my relationship with Peter. Thank you for caring and teaching me from the Word of God. After much prayer, Bible reading, and meditating, on counsel from you and mom. I believe God has given me a perfect peace that Peter is the one for me. Because the Lord has given me such an awesome and secure upbringing, I've struggled in the aspect of trusting the Lord in my relationship with Peter in one area. I'm leaving the known for the unknown. But I do want to enter the unknown with Peter. I don't know what God will have in store for our future, but I'm trusting the Lord to meet our needs and use our lives. I love Peter because Peter loves the Lord. He has a desire to serve him. He has a drive to be the best he can for God. He is patient with me, yet firm when he needs to be. He loves me and he's good to me. He has a consistent spirit and temperament and a good attitude. He desires to grow spiritually. He shares the word of God with me. He seeks counsel and lives his life on purpose. He makes decisions based on principle not on whim or preference. I believe that our strengths and weaknesses complement each other. He's the first person I want to share things with and my favorite person to be with. He's got the chemistry, competency, and character you've always told me to look for. Dad, my desire is to live my life in a way that would please the Lord and make you proud. I love you so very much. What a blessing in my life to have children, have a daughter who would say, I want to do God's will. I want to be with this person because he's spiritual and godly and right for my life. She didn't want to take that step, though, without her daddy's permission. She wanted to make sure that it would be God's will. And I say to many of you young ladies today, you may not always understand your parents. You may not have Christian parents. 
But do your best in honoring your mother and father. Do your best and let God bless and take care of the rest. Here David was a man who honored his father's wishes. But it wasn't just his earthly father. Secondly, it was his heavenly father. David was willing to trust. David decided to trust his heavenly father. 1 Samuel 17, 23, And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. And verse 28, And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep of the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Now may I pause to say this, young men, young ladies, if you intend to live for God, somebody will criticize it. I mean, you expect that from Goliath over here. You expect the worldly crowd to criticize you. They're going to say you're, you're too straight, uh, you're straight and narrow, you're a soul winner, you're weird, you're a nerd. You expect that from the world, but sometimes you get it from those close to you and David said I'm going to serve God and his older brother didn't say attaboy David you go serve God he said I know your pride David some of you are going to try to serve God and you're going to be shocked that somebody in your own church maybe family they, they don't even think you can do it There will be some criticism that will come. But look at what David said in verse number 29. He said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? David said, wait, 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 wait a minute. Am I wrong or is there a Goliath over here challenging us? Is there a a Goliath that's defying us and defying our God? Isn't there a cause here? And and David uh, understood that there was a cause. And David understood that he must stand up and he must make a difference. And I want to tell you young people today, there are those whose cause is sports and those whose cause is uh, perhaps their, uh, their hobby or their music or their boyfriend or girlfriend. But there are some greater causes to live for. And I speak right now of the cause of Jesus Christ. David said, I want to live for the cause, the cause of God. Philippians 1.27 says, we're to stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And we need some young men today who'll take this gospel to another town and another town and another place for the cause of Christ living your life, standing true to the Lord Jesus. I think of the cause of preaching the Word of God. It's a wonderful thing to live for, the Word of God. We don't apologize and don't you let Goliath intimidate you about the fact, what do you mean you're going to go to a Bible college? It's probably not even accredited. You're going to go to Bible college, you can learn the Bible. Yes. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to study the unsearchable riches of the inspired Word of God. I'm going to learn the answers to man's questions. And I'm going to go wherever God sends me. And I'm going to proclaim truth in a land that knows no truth. I'm going to proclaim truth in a land where lies abound. And I'm going to stand up not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will proclaim the truth of the Word of God. Nothing wrong with giving your whole life to living for the Word of God. The cause of Christ, the cause of preaching... 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For after that in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And I made a decision a long time ago. I wanted to live my whole life long helping people to know who Jesus is and knowing what Jesus did and helping them to have the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I figured out along the path to that that the way God uses in helping people understand that is something rather foolish, something rather simple and it's called preaching and it may not be real exciting to the unsaved and it may be kind of stupid to the unsaved but to those of us that believe it is the power of God, my friends. God calls you to live for the cause of Christ and God calls you to be a preacher of the gospel. It's a wonderful thing, my friend, to serve the Lord Jesus and to live for the cause of Jesus Christ. I remember the first time I preached my first message as a 10-year-old boy in the rest home. And I gave the gospel out in the rest home. 
Two or three times I preached there. I remember as an 18-year-old young freshman in college when they said, we have five ladies that want someone to come out and preach out near Indio, California. They'd like you to come and, and preach a message for them. I didn't know a thing about preaching. I'd never had a class on preaching. I didn't know expository from topical. I, I just really didn't know all about it. But I knew this. There was something burning in me. I knew that if I had the chance to tell somebody about Jesus, one, two, five, whatever, I'd be glad to sign up for duty. I drove out there 150 miles and stood up in a little mobile home with those five ladies looking at me like I knew what I was talking about. And I preached about Noah. And I preached about the flood. I preached about Noah standing up for God. I preached about the dew that came down. And I preached about Noah's preaching righteousness and all the animals coming into the ark. And I preached about the fact that Noah was up there in that ark. I mean, I preached and preached and preached about all of the antediluvian society and the judgment of God and the grace of God. I mean, I got it all in there. And it took about seven minutes. Mrs. Chapel always says to me on Sunday afternoons, why don't you preach that message about Noah tonight? That's a really good message. <laughs> the cause of preaching. Why don't some of you live for the cause of the next generation? Why don't some of you say, one day I'd like to be a youth pastor? One day I'd like somehow to, to, to have conferences like this and help teenagers like me. Uh, Joshua chapter 4 and verse 6, uh, Joshua said, uh, that God said to Joshua, this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers uh, in time to come, say, what mean ye these stones? Joshua said, I want to set up an altar here uh, so that our children will remember our faith and will remember our God. And listen, we need some young men who'll say, I'll be a youth pastor someday. What about the cause of missions? What about uh, some young man or young woman today say I don't know where God would have me go but I'm willing to go to the mission field I'm willing to go overseas with the gospel I'm willing to be like a, a brother Joey Weaver whose brother's here brother Todd Weaver uh, from North Carolina I'm willing to go wherever God wants me to go and tell people about Jesus Christ I'm sure thankful today I mean I, I met someone today uh, brother Jess Jessup here from Iowa and he brought a young man one of our graduates brought a young man he said he got saved four months ago listen that's a blessing he is making a difference in Iowa with the gospel of Jesus Christ Christ. Oh, the cause of worldwide missions. I think of the cause of the Great Commission. Oh, what a privilege to live for the cause of Christ. I think of the cause of righteousness and righteous living. I think of Robert Alamy, a Baptist preacher who wrote the Pledge of Allegiance and who wrote in the words, One nation under God. Thank God for those who serve in public places and are not ashamed of our Christian heritage. I'm just saying, young people today, you can live for Goliath if you want. And some of you say, well, when I become a, a senior in high school, when I become a junior in Bible college, then I'm really going to start living for God. Why don't you start now? You can keep living for Goliath or you can go ahead and decide now uh, to serve God. To, uh, decide now to surrender uh, to the call of God. Go ahead and get a start on it. Oh, the defiance of the world is strong. The decision of David was real. But notice thirdly this morning, the defeat of the enemy. Now David, because he had been serving since he was a teenager, David, because he knew the songs of God and because he walked with God, he knew that God could take that Goliath down. You see, one of the reasons today that some young people in here really believe God is able to do certain things is because they've been walking with God a little while. And their tribulations and trials, Romans 5, 3, and 4, has worked hope within them that God could do something with their life. And you must recognize that while Goliath stands and intimidates, listen to me, Goliath can be defeated. Your whole school doesn't have to live for Goliath. Your whole community doesn't have to live for Goliath. And America can still be changed one person, one community, one school, one block at a time. The defeat of the enemy is, is possible because of the power of God. Notice if you would in verse 45 of our text. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. 
This day the Lord will deliver thee into my hand. Verse 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now look, at David didn't stand up and say, Well, Goliath, you have 21,000, we have 27,000 people, you're a dead duck. Look right here. Some of you come from churches with 70 people. Your church can slay Goliath. Don't you leave here thinking, boy, those big churches can do some big things for God. You and your church can do big things for God. We see in this moment, David wasn't boasting in his numbers. We have a wonderful attendance at this year's conference. It means absolutely nothing without the power of God resting on your individual life. The Mormons have numbers. And by the way, the Mormons give two years of their life to march around selling their books and spreading their false gospel. Why don't some of you give one year to Bible college? Ringling Brothers and Bailey, Barnum and Bailey Circus has numbers. Political parties have numbers. David didn't say, Goliath, we're going to take you down because there's more of us than there are of you. And David didn't say, look it, we've got sharper swords and spears. And David didn't say, uh, we've got a, a whole lot of strategy that's going to scare you to death. And we even have PowerPoint and we even have this or that. David didn't say that. David said, Goliath, you're going to come down for one simple reason. There is a God in heaven and the God in heaven that I serve has power. And I've seen him help me take a bear and I've seen him help me take a lion. And you're about to drop down dead because the God that I serve has power over you. That's what he said. Thank God today for his power. And I see a lot of churches and a lot of teenagers today just acting like, well, you know, we got some deacons that got a little money and some of, some of the teenagers, I got some parents, got some money and, you know, I can just kind of live the way I want to live, kind of holding on to their spiritual coattails. Why don't you start learning what the power of God is yourself? Why don't you start praying? Why don't you start claiming your school for God? You see, David knew the power of God was real. Years ago, Muhammad Ali, professional boxer, was on an airplane flying over to Manila. He was going to fight over there, I believe it was Mike Frazier, in a fight called the Thrilla in Manila. If you ever knew anything about Muhammad Ali, his great strength was not humility. The stewardess came by and said, sir, you need to buckle your seatbelt. And he didn't. Just like some teenagers on the way home when the youth pastor says, settle down. And a little while later, she says, sir, you have to, you have to buckle your seatbelt. And he didn't. Finally, he said, she said, now, sir, buckle your seatbelt. He said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. She said, Superman don't need no airplane. Now, buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> You know, I see some churches and some teenagers sometimes, they kind of act like Muhammad Ali. You know, hey, we'll let the Lord know when we need him. We're going to win the world with Goliath's methods. We're going to win the, win the world with, the, we're going to wrap them to Jesus. That's what God says about you. They were just being judgmental. No, I've been reading my Bible. God said, I don't want you cold. I don't want, I'd rather have you cold or hot. I don't want you lukewarm because when you're lukewarm, I want to spew you out of my mouth. Some of you lukewarm Christians, you ought to just get on fire today. Instead of acting like you don't need the Lord. David, David knew he needed God. Oh, listen to me today. David didn't have a little flat rim hat. David didn't have baggy drawers. David didn't have a tattoo. He didn't have Christian rock. Uh, David didn't have any of that, but he had something you ought to have. He had the anointing of God. Amen. Well, I have some friends, and they're just, uh, they're just radically rocking out for Jesus, man. Is that right? How many souls did they have down the aisle last week? How's their purity? How many times have they had fornication in the last month? 
Because I'm telling you right now, the statistics are showing that the radical rock out Christian crowd, they're losing the spiritual battles. Don't play a game with it. David said, Goliath, you're not coming down because of our methods. You're not coming down because we're cooler than you. We're not going to win this victory for other reasons. We're going to win this victory because the battle is the Lord's. And he trusted the power of God. Then I want you to notice, secondly, he defeated the enemy through the provision of God. Now, you know the story, but I want you to see it with me, please. Verse 48. And it came to pass... When the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Now let's just stop right there. I like that. He ran toward him. Brother Rasmussen, can I have your help again, please? Brother, let me just help you right here. Good. Keep it real flat. That's the style, brother. What's your name? How old are you? Perfect. Come here, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, who's 13. Where are you from? Um, here. Lancaster? Well, I just moved here. Welcome. <laughs> See that guy up there? Yeah. Goliath. Thinks he's cool. <laughs> he wants you to dress the way of the world. He wants you to live like the world. He wants you to become impure. He wants to ruin your future marriage. He wants to ruin you. But there's a God in heaven who wants you to defeat him. Amen. That's right. And there's a God in heaven who wants him to come down and he wants Jesus Christ to be exalted. And David said, that's what I want. You know what the Bible says? David ran towards him. He ran towards him. Look at, thank you so much. You don't need to run away. You need to go ahead and stand up. Amen. You need to go ahead and say, I'm going to have the victory. Thank you, Brother Rasmussen. I'll just hold that in case you need it later. <laughs> Look at that. David ran toward the enemy. Verse 49. And David put his hand in the bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead and the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Now listen to me very carefully. God gave David the power of God and God gave David just a particular provision to use. Now some of you might say, well, what did God give him? Sometimes God's going to say to you teenagers, you're going to say, how can I serve God? How can I go to Bible college? How can I stand up for the, for the Lord in my school? Sometimes God says this to people, what is that in your hand? One little boy said to Jesus, well, I got some fish and loaves, Jesus, you want them? <laughs> Moses said, I got a stick here. David was just a teenager. He said, well, he said, what, what I have here is, is I, I have some rocks. Rocks? I mean, all you have is rocks. You're going to be in the Lord's army and you have rocks and a slingshot. Right. That's what the devil says. The devil says to some of you going to public school, well, you know, these kids that go to the Christian school, why, they know the books of the Bible and they know they can quote scriptures in their sleep and they, they have won contests and, and their mothers and fathers are perfect and their mothers and fathers sit in the front row and they, they have three-hour devotionals every morning before they sing their hymnals. God can use them, but all you have is some rocks. You know, like two verses. The only hymn your parents know is Jeremiah was a bullfrog. <laughs> so what, how, how, how can I serve God? Just give him everything you have. You say, I'm 13, I come from a broken home, I, I just started going to church. God wants to use you. If you have a tender heart, little Bible, you start reading it, God will use you. 
See, I'm 18. I, 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 I just got saved. I've just come out of a bad relationship with a girl, with a guy. I, I, I'm dumb. I'm stupid. I can't believe I, I've done it. I, I don't have much left. Just a couple rocks, maybe. Would you give it to the Lord? <laughs> I'd like to go to Bible college, but good night. I work at McDonald's. My total life savings is $7.12. Would you give it to the Lord? You see, God will use you when you are willing to say, Lord, I'm not much. I don't have much. I don't have an 18-pound spearhead. I just have a slingshot. There's a young lady sitting here this morning. I remember her first day on our college campus. I remember when she showed up to West Coast Baptist College with her blue jeans. And she had ankle bracelets and bracelet bracelets and all kinds of stuff. I mean, she, she didn't have a lot of the, you know, other kinds of upbringing. But she had something. A good heart. A couple rocks and a good heart. She came to West Coast. She walked up to me. She said, are you Pastor Chapel?" I said, yes, I am. Who are you? I thought maybe she was, you know, visitor to the church or something. She said, I'm so-and-so. She said, my granddad came to your church, and he said, if you had a college, I should go there. So here I am. I mean, the first week of college, we, we have mostly a lot of fun and we share a few rules. <laughs> and she sat there, and I mean, she was hearing rules after rules and writing them down, not copying an attitude like some do, not like, what do you mean? <laughs> Just writing down. She came up to me a few weeks into the thing. She had a beautiful dress on. She was down to... Two or three ankle bracelets and just a couple other things. And she'd only been to Mrs. Weaver's office a few times so far. And she came up to me and she goes, Pastor, I'm getting ready to go out bus knocking. <laughs> really? Three weeks here starting a brand new ministry. Good. I said, you go knock a bus, just... And then she came up to me maybe about a month later and she said, uh, Pastor, she had tears in her eyes. And she said, uh, I led someone to Jesus today. Amen. I mean, she wasn't like homeschooled in the highest level of the curriculum. I mean, she never had like Saxon math and a Becca book and chapel five times a day. She's had a couple rocks. And she's a youth pastor's wife today taking some Goliaths down. Amen. If you think West Coast is like for the spiritual elite, it's just for people like David. A few rocks, a heart for God, and a willingness to serve. You may not be from what you think is the best home. You may not have had all the advantages, but God wants to use you. God took men like William Carey and men like D.L. Moody out of the back of a little shoe shop and he sent them to the foreign fields and Moody shook two continents with his preaching. I mean, they weren't that special really except for the fact that God touched their lives and they said, Lord, if you want to use us to make a difference, then we're willing to be used. And I want to challenge you teenagers today, live your life for the cause of Jesus Christ and leave this place and make a difference. And when you get home and Goliath says, oh yeah, I defy you to live for God. You stand up to Goliath and you take those little verses you know and you sling them at Goliath and you stand for Jesus Christ. You live for the cause of Christ. You get clean music on your iPod. You throw away that stuff that has cursing and nudity. You just trash it. 
You talk to your mom and dad about how to filter out things that are perverting your mind and you decide, young ladies, to dress now like a full-time a Christian worker. You decide now to have some modesty and you young men decide now uh, to be a Christian man of God and you start being different right now and you're going to make a difference with your life. And the longer you wait to be different, the less the opportunity to make a difference the sooner you get like David, a surrendered heart to serve, the greater God will use you in your life. We are called to make a difference. Will you answer that call? Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you for David's surrender to serve you. Thank you that he answered the call, that he took what he had and gave it to you. Lord, please speak to our hearts in these next few moments. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. No one's moving. This is the most important moment of our day. Perhaps God has been speaking to your heart. How many teenagers are in this room in the balcony on the lower floor? You say, Pastor Chapel. Goliath has been intimidating me with technology, with music, with dress. I've been afraid to stand up to Goliath. But by the grace of God, some of my technology, my dress, my music, I'm going to separate from those things that are of this world. I see today that I must stop being intimidated by Goliath. I want God to touch and clean my life. I want to make a decision to be different. I want to be a different girl, a different boy. I want my life to be different. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand this morning? No more junk, smut, loose living for you. God bless you. You may put your hands down.